Good evening. Let's start the Oda King seminar. Today is January 13th. This will be the second lecture in January. Maybe you can guess how I'm going to start with this on the table. This is a rubber-driven multiplane cell of Ohm. I showed you for the first time in the last lecture. But in that time, I didn't get to show you the backside. It'll be difficult to understand how it works if you don't see the back. Maybe I talked enough about this in the last lecture, but I reassembled it anyway, so let's check this out. This side I showed in the last lecture. It's currently backed by this brown paint, or a blindfold board. Without it, you get a transparent cell. Like this. Which was quite easy to tell, I guess. I'll put this back on for safety. In this overall structure, this is the rubber-driven multiplane part, as I told you in the last lecture. So the multiplane processing is activated by rubber and works like this. Now I'll show you the mechanism. I'll put this down. I can't be too careful, it's never easy. Now you see, this is the back side of the cell. These small white blocks that you see here are guides. These linear ones are rails. They're both made of some kind of paper, maybe cardboard, so the rails slide between these paper guides. This white plate-like part, this is made of rubber. So the mechanism works like this. <laughs> Oops, it's displaced. It, it's so easily displaced. So it moves like this. Nicely made, isn't it? So the cells are connected to each other only in this part and only by means of this rubber piece. So the movement is actually made by the rail sliding on these guides. Phew! I suppose you understood it. Okay, I'll flip this back. So, that was the mechanism. In the actual shooting, they pulled it little by little bit, one cut at a time. They were shooting animation, so they couldn't shoot all the action at once, like they do in special effects movies. Instead, they actually pulled it a little bit for each cut. They did the pulling by referring to a scale on the guide, which marks at a zero point. I suppose it was about 0 0.5 millimeter intervals. So, I guess we're done with this. Okay, okay, okay. Now, for today, I'm going to... Oh! Oh, oh God, I was so nervous. Here you go. Uh, and I also told you in the last episode that I'd finally get a haircut, but I guess I didn't again. So you have to excuse me for my unkempt and messy hairstyle. I think I made you all feel a bit anxious. I was too anxious and so worried that I might touch the wrong place. I felt very uneasy. Oh, the tension. Okay, I told you that I would like to talk about the Whisper of the Harp and what I left behind for Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. I think the weight will be like 90% Nausicaa and 10% Whisper. I do have a good reason for this. I mean, how can I say this? There's something about Whisper of the Harp that I don't fully appreciate, which makes it difficult for me to talk about it forever like Nausicaa. On top of that, the story was first published as a girl's manga, which I won't say that I'm unfamiliar with it, but yet I feel kind of feel disconnected. Still, when I see it as Miyazaki's work, I mean, despite the fact that Whisper of the Heart is generally deemed as Kondo's work, when I see it as Miyazaki's work, there are some interesting points. So you see, it's a little twisted, and that's why I should spend only a limited time. Oh, not should, I mean, I will spend a shorter time. So let's start from Buddha Naushka, or Naushka Wanderabout, and I will pick it up from where I left off. Now... Here. This is a map around the Valley of the Wind in Naushka. 
that we used in the last lecture. The first part of the story mainly takes place in this area. So here you see that the acid sea and the toxic jungle are over there. This land is about 1,000 meters above the sea level. So there's a huge difference in altitude between here and the sea. From this land with an altitude of 1,000 meters, a thin valley meanders down between the canyons. And there is the castle here. The village is located at a higher altitude than the castle. Geographically, the castle is at a relatively low altitude and the field is at an even lower altitude. That was the overview of the map. The Tolmakian ship, the airship carrying the giant warrior, crashes around this point. Then... After that, Tolmekian battleships fly in, but they fly down through the valley right here, which makes it quite a malicious invasion. If they came from this side, villagers would have been able to see them coming. Moreover, if they came from the seaside, they would not bring the spores from the toxic jungle, so it's safer. However, they decide to come down from the toxic jungle side, bringing the spores with them down into the valley to suddenly appear. They make a forced landing at a point before the castle in the central area of the village. And one ship flies to the castle to take control over the area. Meanwhile, Naushka and others were working around the crashing site. So they look up and suddenly find that the Tomekian battleship has already entered their village. So it was a nasty invasion by the Tomekians taking a geographical advantage. I guess now you understand why Naushka was so mad. If they wanted to play fair, they would have come from the sea. Instead, they decide to fly through the valley and make a forced landing, and that is nasty. After that, in the village seized by the Tolmakians, an egg or a pupa of the giant warrior is carried from the crashing point to the castle through the field. The carrying is done by pulling up because this part is a gentle slope, so they have to pull the egg up along the slope. Um, during the absence of Naushka and others, in the village, villagers find that toxic spores have infested the field. Obaba says, we have no choice but to burn down this forest, and they say that the trees protected the water for the village. Specifically, the forest in the field and a vineyard in this area close to the reservoir are infected. So, the villagers go to the castle and request Tolmakians to borrow their burning equipment, their flamethrowers. The villagers get what they want and start burning the trees. Enraged that they have had to burn their forest, the villagers revolt and attack the castle. They were working in the vineyard and descended the slope to make the attack. So, the Tomekians in the castle are only able to defend themselves from the surprise attack. The citizens make the attack from the higher position, using it to their advantage in the battle. Eventually, Tomekian soldiers fight back, forcing the villagers to retreat up the valley. Remember the cliff road Yupa took for a while to pass in the severe sandstorm in the opening scene? Well, the villagers are now forced to move up that road again this way. They come to this desert, pass the insect repelling towers, and flee to the spaceship to face the Tomekians. Like this, there is so much you can understand about the situation when you draw a map. This tells us how desperate the villagers' attack is. I mean, because they are attacking the castle from the higher side of the valley, when they have to withdraw, they have to climb up the valley past this reservoir. They're forced to climb through the village where they live, which is a safe area protected by the wind from the valley, and trek this dangerous zone polluted by the sand with the spores. And the spaceship is only place they can flee to. So a slight change in wind direction during their withdrawal could be fatal. The map tells us about such a fatal risk and that they are really fighting for their lives. So, like I said before, 
The map makes it so much easier to understand the situation. In the climax scene, the herd of Ohms appears from the toxic jungle and marches through the acid sea. The lake is 100 kilometers in diameter, so it's actually a much larger sea of acid, and they come from this side. On the other hand, the giant warrior Awaken moves up all the way through this valley over this sand hill of the desert with the insect repelling towers and arrives at this position, which I think is the highest altitude to face the Ohms. Naushka of the Valley of the Wind is relatively simple in terms of positional relationship. As I told you in the previous lecture, I will upload this map on my blog so people can use it to study more about Naushka. Okay, now I want to move on to the opening sequence of Naushka. Yes, in today's free part, I would talk about the opening sequence of Naushka. The reason why Takahata panned it and about Whisper of the Heart, I'll talk about the first part of these topics. Okay. Well, well, I'll start from the part after the pre-credit, which was a topic in the previous lecture. The pre-credit is a small drama part before the opening title of a movie. After Yupa's line, another village consumed in the toxic jungle, this text appears to describe the history explaining what has happened to mankind. Then, the opening sequence begins. The opening sequence tells us what happened. What happened before the world was consumed in the toxic jungle using a tapestry. The tapestry includes... Here it is. This famous image. The one with the title. So... This is a watercolor painting drawn on a piece of cloth. This was actually drawn at the final stage of the production. Miyazaki, who has finished all of his work, drew it with watercolor paint. This was mentioned by directors Hideaki Anno and Ryoichi Katayama in the DVD audio commentary. They did for the Nausicaa DVD. Anno asked, so Miyazaki drew this at the end of the production? When he was done with his part of the job, Anno left the studio to go back to Osaka before the production was completed. So he didn't know that it was drawn by the director. Katayama replied that while we were busting our asses doing the final check and other works, Miyazaki, who was done with his job, seemed to have had a fun time drawing it. He was humming. Well, this Katayama's word sounds a little meaner than necessary, I thought. So, this is the first image in the opening sequence of Naushka, which Miyazaki is said to have had a fun time drawing. As I just mentioned before, he drew it after he finished all his work. This means that Miyazaki revisited the opening after completing the animation film. On the other hand, the same image in the storyboard was drawn before the production, and is slightly different. This is the same opening image of Naushka in the storyboard. It looks almost the same. The upper part represents the world of the Valley of the Wind, with the image of Naushka. The lower part has an image of Oroboros, the two-headed snake, which is a symbol of Tomekia, but it's slightly different in details. The difference is that in the lower symbol, tongues, which may look like the flame, are extending from both heads of this snake toward the sword, and the two images are contrasted by red and blue. It might seem like a minor difference, but actually it represents a huge change. The image in the storyboard was what Miyazaki planned it to be before the production. But when he drew the tapestry after the production, Miyazaki wanted it to be in this arrangement. He wanted the images of Naushka and Tomekia to be reversed. This side has a woman drawn, so what it represents is obvious. So, Miyazaki wanted to highlight this side with the sword, which represents Kushana, the princess of Tomekia. He wanted to emphasize that the story was about two characters, Kushana and Naushka. Unfortunately, Toshio Suzuki, the producer, was against this last-minute decision. He said that the title has the name Naushka, so let's stay focused on her. So, Miyazaki reluctantly had to go with the initial arrangement. So this is how Miyazaki actually wanted it. 
During the production of Naushka, he realized that the story was not only about Naushka, but also about the two women, Kushana and Naushka. In an interview after the film production, Miyazaki described them as two sides of the same coin. So he divided a single persona in two. This is quite a common practice in movies. Conflicting characters representing various sides of contradicting feeling of one person physically appear to speak the lines, externalizing the anguish of the person. When a person thinks, what shall I do, what should I do, it's hard for the audience to read it unless the character actually says it. So, various sides of the internal anguish of a person appear as respective characters to confront each other. And that's what makes a drama. Miyazaki was not aware that this applied to the two characters when he was making the storyboard, so he was simply drawing symbols. He strongly realized it when he was drawing the tapestry as a final touch in the film production. The presence of Kushana grew bigger and bigger inside him. Then, he realized that it was actually about two princesses who are on different sides, Valley of the Wind and Tomekia, but sharing the same anguish. I'll go into this further in the second half. As you can see in this example, people often wonder what the creator was thinking when they see their work, but sometimes that's just meaningless. This is because Miyazaki himself, when asked questions such as, what motivated you to make this film? What are you trying to say in this film? Often answers, I don't know, that's why I had to work hard. So he drew the storyboard without really being sure where he was going. He was drawing the tapestry after the film production was completed, and that's when he realized that he wanted to make the story about Naushka and Kushana. So he tried to flip the images upside down. In this manner, sometimes the creator figures out the theme of the movie while they are making it. So this was the first cut in the opening sequence which shows the title. Okay. Next, the opening sequence with this melody ta, 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 shows something of development of mankind. In the storyboard, this picture comes with the footnote saying, Mankind, once prospered, built magnificent cities reaching the sky and used miraculous techniques to produce flying ships to travel among the stars. These ships are flying above the sun and above the shooting star. So, they are not merely flying ships, but they are ships that fly in outer space to travel among the stars. More than one picture representing the stars are drawn to indicate that they were able to travel between different solar systems. I think it's easier to understand in the storyboard. Or, maybe not. In the storyboard, it has a shooting star, and this is the moon, eclipse moon, stars, and the sun to emphasize more that the ship is in outer space. Actually, the image imparts traveling to other solar systems rather than other planets. These buildings drawn in this part are described as reaching the sky in the storyboard. So, you should actually imagine them as buildings several thousand meters tall. We would vaguely imagine them as modern skyscrapers, but this is depicted as an apocalyptic world 800 years from our time. In this flourishing world, the giant warriors are created. So, we move on to the pre-credit in the opening sequence. You have to pay attention to these margin parts. These are pigs, a symbol of prosperity. This kind of symbol represents flourishment. In the time of prosperity, people resort to gluttony and endless fights. Swords are drawn in the lower margin, so these two symbols represent gluttony and endless fights respectively. That was the time when the giant warriors were created. This picture well depicts the grotesqueness of people making man-shaped objects. This tapestry is followed by the image of the Armageddon finally breaking out. Like this. You can see that the margins no longer have pigs of prosperity or swords. Instead, they are now filled with graphic images of skeletons buried in the ground. So, all hell breaks loose. You can see the giant warrior spinning fire and people falling from buildings. These buildings are also actually several thousand meters high, like those we already saw. They are all burned down and the world is collapsing. 
This layer of the giant warrior resembles Hokusai's print of a giant skeleton titled Gasha Dokuro, but facing the opposite direction. I also feel a slight essence of South American paintings from this layer. This margin, which here insinuates an enormous number of deaths, is quite interesting. And... The subsequent scene shows... Here it is. It shows the actual giant warriors. This is one good way of transitioning between the scenes. I mean, it will be a bumpy transition if just you jump directly to the animation part from the tapestry. So what Miyazaki did was he slid in a partially enlarged view after the tapestry image. This transition between cuts is an extremely instinctive sense of virtuosity. I can't imagine someone other than Miyazaki pulling off such a trick. When this scene comes along, Ano in the audio commentary says, This opening sequence is so well made. He is praising the virtuosity in this transition between cuts. This scene is briefly succeeded by the enlarged view of the creature's head and then the actual moving giant warriors appear. So you can easily follow the transition. If you just simply jump from tapestry to animation, it would seem quite odd and inconsistent. But if you slip in this single cut of enlarged view, the audience can have time to imagine what the warriors are watching, the world of apocalypse, and then suddenly you see this scene. The thousand meter buildings collapsing and objects so big are standing. And they are colossal. In this tapestry, you see the eye of the giant warrior. And this smoothly guides your attention to their eyes, which are the only things glowing in this screen. I mean, one of the glowing things, including their spears. This kind of transition is not something you can learn. Theoretical type of anime directors can't do this. It's really an impulsive flash of genius. That's why Ano doing the audio commentary is saying, so well made. Historical facts you can learn from this scene is that these giant warriors actually had a height of several hundreds or even a thousand meters. You can see that from these buildings collapsed. So these humongous giants are neatly aligned side by side. We cannot even imagine how many of them are lined up. We can only see what's captured within the animation frame. But actually, this is an image of these huge 1,000 meter tall giants aligned side by side all the way to the horizon destroying the world. So, they are making the march of death over the world and nothing can escape from them. The result is shown by the tapestry again. So, this tapestry, this no longer has the upper margin, but only this lower margin. The upper part of the tapestry is intentionally trimmed so that the audience is focused on the lower part to see these dead people curled up. Earlier, the tapestry showed symbolic abstract images of swords, pigs, and fish. But now they show images of curled human bodies which can clearly be recognized as human corpses buried underground. Everything is swallowed into the flames. Every life in this world, such as birds, animals, and even plants, are lost in flames. This is what the tapestry tells us. So, any living creature appearing thereafter in the story of Naushka, like frogs and horse claws, are all gene-manipulated creatures. The tapestry briefly insinuates that the world was reset, and almost all living creatures other than human beings, like animals and plants, were made extinct. The tapestry again transitions to an animation part. The audiences are now used to this transition. We should pay attention to the city burned in a flame and a difference in size between the buildings and the giant warriors. This again expresses how enormous they are. There is a special effects film titled Giant God Warrior Appears in Tokyo. It was not widely released in public, it was just shown in an exhibit called Special Effects Museum. I think you can still see some highlight scenes on YouTube.
The short film depicted the warrior with the size relatively faithful to this image. So we should imagine that they are creatures actually hundreds to 1,000 meters tall. And this is a march of such creatures. As you can see in Howl's flying battle scene in Howl's Moving Castle, Miyazaki avoids drawing what's happening on the ground during mass destruction and genocide scenes. Another example is a scene in Future Boy Conan. So, as in Howl, Miyazaki only shows what went on at a high altitude, like what was happening in the sky. And he doesn't show the consequences down on the ground, like how people die or how people run around in the flames. This is because when Miyazaki was making Nausicaa, he strongly kept in mind that he was making a children's film. Well, a huge difference from Isao Takahata, who graphically depicted a B-29 air raid. So these details are depicted from a bird's eye view from slightly above the warriors. And next is another scene showing the giant warriors. Half of the images in the tapestry in the opening sequence are actually about the giant warriors. The scene shows the warriors vanishing into the horizon. You can slightly see the Earth's roundness, a further indication of how enormous the vanishing giants are. Miyazaki is truly a genius in layouts. He definitely did not draw the roundness just to show some bulging ground. He slightly drew the ground round to show the enormousness of the warriors. So they are different from those we see in the main part of the film, such as the one that has turned to stone or that awakens in the climax scene. Those don't even have the spears. These are the scary ones. And none of them come back in the anime or manga version. Now this is the scene. After the destruction by the warriors in the opening sequence, the song still continues. These are not insects, which are yet to appear. They are described as birds of death in the storyboard. This does not literally mean that the birds are flying. Only the birds with skulls in their beaks flying over the collapsed buildings in the destructed world. This is a metaphor of death ruling the world. Just when you thought that nothing has escaped death, inchworms appear in the lower margin. And some pill bug like creature appears at the end of a long series of bones. So the world of insects starts from this world ruled by death. Now, the tapestry shows a series of events. This shows that the new ecosystem is born. The upper margin is filled with roly polies. The lower margin shows the sun. These suns represent brand new days. The sun rises and sets. The apocalyptic destruction has ended and it's the start of the new days. It's the world of insects. So, it shows that the world is now ruled by insects and these some kind of fungus. The fungus is growing and here you can see the sun rising again. This scene, this slides directly to this scene, like this. The insects in the upper margin and the rising and setting suns on the lower side gradually transform into symbols to represent that it's getting close to the present time in the story. So, it's getting closer to the present time, new age where the insects rule the world and people can only live in limited areas. You see this big sign like in the Bible. In the Bible, in the time before printing became popular, the first page in a new chapter had an opening sentence beginning with an extremely complex decorative letter. You should see this like that, an extremely decorative opening letter that looks like R, S, or G. The opening letter indicating the beginning of the new lives of humans. In this life of humans, the deceased and those who are forced to live in limited areas are seeking salvation. They seek salvation and with the song coming into the climax, da -da -da, a new legend is born. As I mentioned earlier, the symbols indicate the present time. Present to the future, the people are hoping for a flying goddess with white wings clothed in a blue robe will someday come to save the world again. 
一回救ってくれるだろうってことで、チャンラン、チャラランラランラン、and all of a suddenly, bam, this bright blue sky fills the screen. Another amazingly well constructed sequence. You almost feel as you already finished watching a movie. Actually, almost all we saw was the tapestry drawn with watercolor paint by humming Miyazaki, and bam, the blue sky. The clouds in this blue sky are pulled in a lateral direction at different speeds using the multiplane mechanism, like the one I mentioned earlier. They're pulled in different speeds so that we feel like we are seeing something magnificent. We see the sky, just the bright blue sky, but we can't help being a little moved by it. It just so suddenly appears. This transition between cuts, it's just amazing. A work of a true genius. <laughs> it's, it's for dramatically resetting the mood of the audiences. I mean, they have to stand a long sequence of depressing episodes. <laughs> Miyazaki first shows this depressing image and makes us think, oh no, this world is hopeless. Then the scene suddenly turns into a bright blue sky, so the audience suddenly lightens up. You feel refreshed with the apocalyptic world suddenly turning into a clear blue sky. These clouds in the next scene, I'll show you a panel including three cuts. From the top image, it shows the white clouds sweeping the sky, shredding shadow over the toxic jungle, the forest full of fungus. Amazing sequence. You see the side view of the clouds, and then you see them in the bird's eye view to get the entire image. And from the shadow of the clouds over the toxic jungle, one white aircraft appears. And just when everyone realizes that this is the angel with wings, you get this zoom in image. This glider in the zoomed in image is gliding from the upper right toward the lower left. It shouldn't be depicted as gliding this way. If you do that, it's difficult to show that it's gliding. They pulled it delicately toward this side to show that it's gliding. They had no intention of showing high speed gliding. Instead, they wanted to show a rather floating quality. The white clouds shed shadows over the toxic jungle. The glider carrying Naushka called Maeve appears from the shadows of the clouds, and with the direction varying in this scene, it's going this way. But when the scene changes, it's sliding laterally so you can feel the floating quality. And Naushka's face has not appeared yet. Then, the scene changes to show a close up view of her, but without her face shown. Instead, it shows the blue sky again, while showing the posture of Naushka's flying over the toxic jungle down below. You see the jet nozzle, so you can realize that civilization has perished, but the humans did not lose everything. They even have jet engines. This small protrusions, this represents the genius of Miyazaki and mechanic design. What they do is that if Maeve makes a belly landing, this engine frame outside the engine may deform. The engine also serves as a nozzle. So the deformation will directly lead to heavily compromised injection efficiency. So ideally, it should have landing gears, but that was not an option. So he put these two antenna like thingies. Miyazaki designs them to look like they are deformable and may be usable as aileron or as landing gears. This little detail helps to evade nosy questions like how the hell is she able to balance on the aircraft with the body entirely serving as wings, which is supposed to be so unstable? These two protrusions provide various possibilities, such as they also serve as the landing gears and they can be held by Naushka when boarding the aircraft and can serve as aileron to counter such a question. Like this, I'm always astonished by how good Miyazaki designs aircrafts and machines. So, we still haven't seen Naushka's face. She is flying. In the next scene, here it is. We see a giant warrior turn to stone. 
Maeve glides over it. The shadow of it moves across the warrior. All the movements are expressed with the shadow moving over other objects. This scene finally tells us what has happened to the giant warriors, which we already saw so much in the tapestry during the opening sequence. The huge giant warriors destroyed the world, and they ended up turning to stone and buried in the toxic jungle. And the girl is smoothly flying over it, so we can realize that the destruction was way back in the past. You see, this single scene alone tells us about the historical time flow in the tapestry of the opening sequence, the aftermath and the elapse of time. The next scene where Glider lands and Naushka pulls out her rifle is also extremely well made, but I'll skip that. Naushka's carrying her gun on her shoulder is just about to enter the forest and the text directed by Hayao Miyazaki shows up to conclude the opening sequence. This is perfect. The entrance of Naushka into the woods is actually a contrast to the final scene. The final scene of this movie, Naushka entering the woods alone and what he shows us in the closing sequence. The closing sequence is also fascinating. It's easier to understand what is going on in the opening sequence thanks to the tapestry guiding the audiences through the storyline. What's going on in the closing sequence is a little more difficult to comprehend and I'll get to that in the second half. When we pay attention to each cut in the closing sequence, it tells you what the story of Naushka is all about. The resultant relationship among Tomekia, Pejai, and the Valley of the Wind. And that explains what Naushka is doing and what Yupa is doing. So the ending tells us a lot. However, we just finished watching an epic story and just say, um, and start paying attention to the closing credits. That's what we Japanese people do. We see text, we read it. That's why many people fail to properly comprehend the closing sequence. I'll get to that as well. Okay, so I guess that's about it for the opening sequence. About this, Naushka of the Valley of the Wind. No, never mind. Isao Takahata said, well, a guidebook called Roman Album was published after the release of the film. I've talked about this so many times, but in the book, Takahata pan Naushka giving it 30 out of 100 to mark it as a failure. That's so harsh. He said, quote, I as a producer thought it was perfect, but I as a friend of Miyazaki thought the work was only 30 out of scale of 100, considering what he can offer. Of course, an adaptation of the original comic book story to the film was fairly good. Still, I anticipated that this film would bring Miyazaki to the next level. That's why I can only give it 30 out of 100. I think what Takahata couldn't stand was that Miyazaki did not depict the life in the Valley of the Wind and that he used salvation of God as the theme. This is because... He adds the reason he dislikes the film in Ghibli's textbook, Volume 1 for Naushka, published by Bunge Shunju. It's written in page 151. He said it does not reflect the modern society. It means that he could not see how it was linked with the modern society and civilization. The Valley of the Wind seems to be agricultural society, but also seems that it's not. He said Miyazaki failed to answer or intentionally ignore the question how people should live in the post-apocalyptic world. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, Naushka knows that the world, purified once again, is lying beneath the toxic jungle. Yet, she refuses to immigrate to that world. She does not attempt to bring the people of the valley to the world under the toxic jungle. She claims that the Valley of the Wind, a place where people get sick and die at an early age, is the society, the world they have to cherish. But the reason is not depicted. How their life in the Valley of the Wind, where people die at an early age, could be more precious than in the new world beneath the toxic jungle is not depicted. Takahata clearly stated that was because there were too many action scenes. He thought that the battle with the giant warrior was okay, but it was something that could have been omitted. He thought Miyazaki should have depicted the life in the village instead. For example, how the villagers cook in their kitchen, how they eat, how they sleep, what are the children's rooms are like. None of these are in the film. 
Is this how Hayao Miyazaki's film should be? He does have a point in the film. The life in the Valley of the Wind is not depicted at all. And Takahata criticized Miyazaki for not giving enough time to depict everyday life in the village. That's true. We do kind of take it for granted that there is a life going on in the Valley of the Wind, but that's not depicted in the film at all. There is almost no scene where you see people eat, like you see a lot in other Miyazaki films. All you can see is Nausuka and Asbel eating chico nuts that taste awful. However, Miyazaki just couldn't use much time depicting the everyday life in the Valley of the Wind, considering how traumatized he was by the Castle of Cagliostro fiasco. Remember, Miyazaki made Nausuka after the Castle of Cagliostro, that biggest box office bomb in the history of Toho animation films. The enraged executive of Toho Cinema said, I've never seen an animation film this unpopular. That was Cagliostro, a film that deprived Miyazaki of opportunities to make new films for years, and Nausuka was the next chance Miyazaki finally got. So he couldn't take the risk. If he spent time depicting the everyday life, it would just be like, no offense, it would be like Horus. Miyazaki cooperated with Takahata to make The Great Adventure of Horus. The everyday life was depicted meticulously and ended up being the worst box office nightmare in the history of toy animation films. He could not take the same path. The depiction of the everyday life takes so much time and the running time will exceed three hours. The running time actually did become close to three hours with the first draft of the storyboard. Now, there's a magazine book called Mook and there is one title, Manga DNA the god of manga successors, which was published to commemorate the 20th anniversary of Osamu Tezuka Cultural Prize. It's too heavy, so I didn't bring it here today. Anyway, Toshio Suzuki gave a comment in the book. Hayao Miyazaki always keeps a deadline. He never missed a deadline when he was doing a comic series of Naushika. And that is Takahata's influence. This does not mean that Takahata keeps the deadline. When they were young, before I met him, they created an animation film called The Great Adventure of Horus. It was scheduled to be made in a year, but Takahata took three years. They got into a huge fight with the production company, who told them that if they couldn't make the movie, the production would be cancelled. I heard Miyazaki cried. They took three years. The company said that Takahata promised it would be done in a year, they were not doing this anymore. The production would cancel. Miyazaki recalled how hard they had to negotiate with the company and knowing all his effort was not to have the project canceled. He was completely lost. That made him just burst into tears. Meanwhile, Takahata couldn't understand the feeling of Miyazaki sobbing and simply said that it's almost done. They have to resume the production. He said it like there was nothing wrong. Miyazaki, when hearing that thought, what is this guy? He is way beyond unbelievable. And so he made a promise to himself that when he got a job with Deadline, he would never break it. About this attitude of Takahata, who only cared about the quality of the film and not what others had to go through, Miyazaki clearly thought, I cannot go that far. The guy is inhumane, just scary. So, referring back to Suzuki's comments, to meet the deadline, Miyazaki even now does not hesitate to delete any scene, no matter how significant it may be, once he feels that he is behind the schedule. In the storyboard of Naushka, there was a combat scene between the giant warrior and Ohms. Hideaki Anno, who later produced Evangelion and Shin Gojira, was working as a staff member for Naushka. He still says that he really wanted to make the physical combat scene between the giant warrior and Ohms. He still regrets it. That's how frustrating it was for him to give up the scene. This is Miyazaki's policy, regrettably curtailing the story and deleting important scenes just to meet the deadline. It's an emotional decision, not a reasonable one, but such a regrettable decision is impossible for Takahata to make. He took eight years to make The Tale of the Princess Kaguya without hesitation. If he was told that the production was cancelled because he's lazy, he'd just think, cancelled? Okay, what the hell? So, Takahata saw Nausuka as a product of compromise. The daily life scene was deleted to meet the deadline, and to put more action scenes to make it catchy for the audience. It was an unnecessary sacrifice that only negatively impacted the quality of the film. That's why the score he gave was 30. When he knew about it, Miyazaki got so furious, he ripped up the guidebook. But Suzuki pointed out that Miyazaki was fully aware of that when he directed Nausuka. 
He told Miyazaki, You compromised. You made a film that could only get 30 out of 100 from Takahata who created Horus, a huge commercial failure. And your movie was a huge hit. I know you felt happy with the commercial success. And that made Miyazaki cry again. The word, I know you felt happy with the commercial success, made him cry because it was a message from the producer claiming that Miyazaki was enjoying the glory as a product of compromise, a massive backstabbing message. Miyazaki was like, even you, Suzuki? So he cried. I just love these episodes of Miyazaki. The other one of the factors Takahata couldn't stand was much more serious. The point I just mentioned was a scheduling issue, which was from the producer's point of view, but the other point of Takahata was more concerned with the concept of the film. I mean, Nashka. Excuse me, it's already past 45 minutes. I think it will take an hour for the first half again. Well, Miyazaki used the God's salvation as the theme of the movie. How the humans who destroyed the natural environment should live. Miyazaki resorted to religion as a source of salvation and solution for the humans who destroy the natural environment. Unlike in the manga version, in the Nashka film, the birth of the toxic jungle in Oms was nothing but a course of nature. What that means is that the Mother Earth just managed to cover or make up for the sins of humanity polluting the sea, the air, and the land. So the birth of the toxic jungle, the birth of Oms, and the resultant regeneration of pure land, they were all a course of nature. This function of Mother Nature can be directly translated as an act of God. A simple adaptation of the concept of Christianity, a monotheism in an animistic world. Simple replacement of nature with God and vice versa. People are stupid, God is great. God gives us salvation. It's exactly the same. People are stupid, nature is great. The mother nature gives us salvation. The story is that simple. Sinner, people are simply saved. Like Jesus crucified on behalf of the human race, the toxic jungle sucked up the poison from the land to create clean water. Takahata criticized there was no difference. This kind of thought is totally against the concept Miyazaki and Takahata adopted and practiced from when they were young. Communism and Marxism basically deny the existence of God. Here is a scene from a manga by Yuji Aoki. Okay, so let's say your wife got very sick. You need a lot of money for her treatment, an amount of money you can never afford. Oh God, please save my wife. Would praying to God save her? Well, that's... No, it won't. What you need is money and doctor, not God. And then this character writes materialism on the whiteboard and says, So once you assume that there is no God, you can see things clearly. This is materialism, the easiest explanation on materialism in this world. <laughs> I'm not sure whether his rendition of materialism is 100% correct, but this is the basic concept. I mean, you explain supernatural sequence in history, Mother Nature and God using materialistic causal relationships only, without using any abstract factors. That's why it's called materialism, seeking solution using materialistic causal relationships only. This is actually supposed to be the basic concept for Takahata and Miyazaki's works. So, the plot where the catastrophic situation arises and Mother Nature just giving salvation with no reason is totally against this concept. Would praying turn the toxic jungle back into the land? The polluted land restores its original shape? I don't think so. What we need to do is burn the, the toxic jungle down. This is Kushana's idea and this is materialism. Naushka's idea on the other hand is that the nature saves the day in the end with humans doing nothing at all and everybody's happy. She offers nothing more than a religious concept. You see the difference? This is not the end of Takahata's criticism. Then... I want to spread the concept of materialism by Karl Marx so that people won't be a victim of capitalism. This zealous message was in Yuji Aoki's mind when he was writing Naniwa Kin Yudo. It says, Karl Marx, a 19th century German economist who analyzed the system of capitalism and founded Marxism. 
It also says, Marx pointed out that advanced development of capitalism will result in the formation of communism. This is important. He didn't say that communism is about denying capitalism. Instead, he said as the capitalism developed more and more and became mature, communism would rise as a result of the maturity. So, the toxic jungle and OMS should not be a salvation given by Mother Nature. To clean up the polluted land to restore a clean environment once again. If you do that, it would just be uh, religious stuff. According to Marxism, the toxic jungle and OMS have to be created by humans. Mother Nature is not simply replacing the highly advanced industrial society. That's not Marxism. According to the concept, the toxic jungle has to be the result of the over-ripening of the advanced industrial society. Miyazaki accepts the criticism and rebuilds the setting of the toxic jungle in later episodes of the manga version of Naushka with the idea of materialism. Actually, it will be revealed that the toxic jungle and Olms are all artificially created by humans in the final days of the industrial society. So the setting of these elements in the manga version conform well to Marxism. So Takahata has a point when he criticized this second problem that Naushka was a religious story and has nothing to do with Marxian. As a result of the denial of the conceptual part of the film by Takahata, Miyazaki took eight years after finishing the film version of Naushka to conclude the manga version with Naushka facing an even higher level of hopelessness in the end. That is, she finds out that the toxic jungle Olms and even mankind are all artificial beings created by the advanced industrial society. So, the Marxian concept of how the development of the advanced industrial society led to the birth of the toxic jungle brought the despair of Nausicaa to an even higher level than that in the film version. After this, Miyazaki was unable to make such a plot that a higher being saves a stupid humanity. You can see this in Princess Mononoke. The forest is healed after the death of the forest spirit, or Daidara Bochi. However, it was not the virgin forest where spirits used to live. It was nothing more than what can be seen as a countryside forest managed by farmers. This was the theme Miyazaki came up with. Humans cannot live without killing forest gods. This was the idea of Lady Eboshi and Princess Mononoke. Meanwhile, Ashitaka comes to a conclusion that humans cannot live without killing forest gods, and that this is the original sin of humans. It's a sin, so people have to respect those they killed. It was a long way to go for Miyazaki to write such a conclusion. He was able to create this Princess Mononoke thanks to the complete denial of Naushka. This is what makes Takahata a mentor of Miyazaki. They are the two sides of the same coin, like Kushana and Naushka. That's how I see them. Oh my god, it's almost nine. I've already spent almost an hour. Okay, now we move on to Whisper of the Heart. Okay, now let's get started on the next topic, Whisper of the Heart. The idea of making the film Whisper of the Heart started when Miyazaki was relaxing in a holiday house in Shinshu, owned by his relative. A girl who is a relative of his has left a girl's manga magazine called Ribbon in the holiday house. Miyazaki had nothing else to do, so he started reading it. After that, Miyazaki started a discussion with other people spending the holiday with him, such as Mamoru Oshi and Hideaki Anno. He asked, can you make this into an anime or is it possible to make an anime out of girls manga in the first place? This means Miyazaki has completely denied the long line of works that established the history of girls anime, such as Candy Candy and Majoko Meguchan. To him, those are not girls anime. Those are not an anime adaptation of girls manga but created by the same idiom used by Osamu Tezuka to make anime from boys manga. So the question was, can you make an animation adopting the unique idiom of girls manga? More specifically, Miyazaki saw girls manga as, as he wrote in the proposal, the world of sweet and sentimental lies. And there is this pure feeling that can only be depicted using the sweet and sentimental lies. That's what makes girls manga special to him. You see, this pure feeling, which can only be depicted using the sweet and sentimental lies. He thought depicting such a feeling was worth trying. This is what he was thinking.
Miyazaki wrote the storyboard asking himself, can I do this? This is how the film Whisper of the Heart was created. Back then, Miyazaki stood up to be a producer, storyboard writer, and scenario writer to give more opportunities to animators around him. I mean, I won't say his juniors because who started working before who does not have much meaning in the animation industry. Anyway, he wanted to give more opportunities to younger generation, so he appointed Kondo to be the director. How did he try to express the sweet and sentimental lies without losing reality? He decided to go full realism. He decided to express the sweet and sentimental lies through the fully realistic depictions of everyday life. An extremely realistic expression in the opening sequence. You can feel the rivalry against Only Yesterday by Isao Takahata everywhere in the sequence. So let's check out the opening sequence of Whisper of the Heart. I'll explain how it's made. The melody, country, road, opens up this opening sequence of Whisper of the Heart. You see a night view of a city. In this night view, only these points of light are blinking. So beautiful. Then the title appears, and this very thin train runs this way. This train is the only object making a large movement, so it catches your eyes. The story flows with this train kept in focus, making the audience's sight follow the train. What you first see is a grand night view of Tokyo from an extremely high altitude, and only the train is moving. Next, you see a relatively large terminal station. It's a little difficult to see, but, but this thin train makes a curve to enter the station. Again, the train is almost the only thing moving, so it attracts the audience's attention. The audiences speculate that the story begins when the train stops. The altitude drops step by step. You see? This is very high. The view from an altitude of over a thousand meters switches to several hundred meters where you can visually identify each building. Then, you get a view at an altitude of about 100 meters. It's also difficult to see in this image. But this train has entered the station and has come to this point. And it stops. When I first saw it, I thought that the story starts when I saw the train stopping at this point. However, the story did not start. Instead, the train leaves the station. From this curved motorway, you can see the buildings far ahead, and you can slightly see the train which starts moving again. So, you first see the bird's eye view of a big city, Tokyo, and then you see a terminal station in a rather rural area. The train stops there, but leaves the station toward a more austere, darker place without these buildings. It's headed to a rural suburb. Then, next you see a balcony of World Emporium, a local antique shop to be visited in the film. In the balcony, an old man is relaxing, and then you see the train we saw, running far over the handrail of the balcony. The scene changes step by step toward the rural side, with the camera following this train and with the altitude gradually decreasing. The train finally stops. These three images, let's check from the top. A railroad crossing, finally the camera is at the ground level. There is a railroad crossing and a woman waiting for it to open. The train slows down and stops at the station. The train stops at the station and a door for a conductor compartment first opens, and then the doors for the passengers open. The details are carefully depicted. This woman slightly turns her head when the train passes by. Her sight is following the train. What a meticulously constructed scene. So the camera has practically descended to the ground level. The story finally begins with the train stopped. The next scene is... This closer side is the station. 
Many people who were on the train come out from the station. So in summary, you first see the bird's eye view of Tokyo from uh, 1,000 meters high. The camera keeps following the train as it's headed to the suburb, which finally stops at a small station with a railroad crossing. And any people come out. And now you see a convenience store right here, an actual existing convenience store franchise, and people are heading towards it. Then you see the protagonist, Shizuku, as she comes out from the convenience store with a blank expression on her face and with a single carton of milk she bought in her hand. The protagonist finally appears. This is not a dramatic entrance of the protagonist you typically see in Miyazaki films. Very subtle expression. From high up in the sky, the camera gradually descends and shows the people moving toward the convenience store near the station. The protagonist is the only one coming out from the store, so she stands out. Well, I, I strongly feel that this is definitely Miyazaki's film. Toshio Suzuki and Isao Takahata made some comments in a book, a book about the whisper of the heart, proving my point. They said that it was an experiment to see whether a Miyazaki film can be made without Miyazaki, a huge experiment. And they said it was successful. In Ghibli's textbook, Suzuki said, we did succeed in making a Miyazaki film without Miyazaki, but I'm still not sure it was a good thing or not. You can find many traces of Miyazaki he left in this animation film. For example, my personal favorite is the one where he did something he rarely does in his movies. Shizuku, in a scene close to the ending, feels so embarrassed after showing her first novel, she wrote to the old man who owns World Emporium. The old man says it's amazing. But Shizuku goes on saying, no, it's not, I'm so embarrassed. And in the next scene, the two have hot noodles because her body got cold. Frankly, this scene is so erotic. The girl shows something that makes her more embarrassed than taking off her clothes for the first time in her life to this old guy who is like a mirror image of Miyazaki. And then comes the scene where they slurf noodles, like after they had an affair or something. This, only this scene in the entire film has an oddly erotic atmosphere. When I saw it, I thought, okay, Miyazaki slightly slipped it in. You see, he is very good at less noticeably slipping in an erotic sequence. You can also see that in Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Nausicaa captured by a Pejite man screams, Aspel! And in that scene, her breasts are shaking. I mean, a lot. This is pointed out by Hideaki Anno. This breast shaking is really something, he said in the audio commentary. He further went on saying Miyazaki was the first one to show breast shaking in animation. Let me explain this in detail. It's this scene. She screams Aspel in anxiety. She leans back and her breasts rise to her chin. Then she leans forward so the breasts come even higher than the chin level. And then the breasts come down again. This major breast shaking sequence. I bet no one watching the broadcast version on TV finds it erotic. They just think that it's nothing more than a scene naturally showing Naushka's anxiety. But I heard Miyazaki and the production team went crazy in this scene saying it's so sexy. This is what Miyazaki does. Another example is pointed out by Katayama. Naushka flies out on her glider from Pejite's aircraft. Then, after that, there is a scene where she flies like this. Katayama saw it and revealed that when Miyazaki was drawing the scene, he was giggling and saying, she's flying out there with her legs wide open like that. She has no decency. Ano said, he's an old guy to give Miyazaki a break. Katayama responded, he was drawing the scene, saying, what a shameless girl. And Ano replies, oh, that poor old man. This conversation is in the audio commentary. He slipped in such a scene during a tense scene where audiences get too nervous to care about such a detail. It's more like, if you find this erotic, you will be ashamed of yourself. 
This scene as well. If you find this scene erotic, you will be ashamed of yourself. And this scene, if you find this erotic, you will be ashamed of yourself. Like this, the old man loves to slip in erotic seeds. He draws it while giggling. Uh, this this kind of trace of Hayao Miyazaki you can find relatively a lot in the Whisper of the Heart, and that's interesting. Later, Katayama starts to talk about things completely unrelated to what they're watching. He asks, you know, there was Kushana's awakening scene before the awakening of the warrior. Anna replies, nope. It was a scene where Kushana was brought back to the castle for recovery. Specifically, she was in the amniotic fluid, like liquid, to heal her wounds. In the awakening scene, an artificial uterus splits open and the fluid pours all over Kushana and she comes out in a bloody mess from the fluid. So, there was a scene where, like a mother giving birth to her child, Kushana comes out with blood like red fluid all over her body. Miyazaki cut that scene as well, saying there's not enough time in this movie. So like this, it's Miyazaki's signature move to slip in a bloody sequence or an erotic sequence in a relatively tense place. He slips it in as an important scene in a drama, so it's less noticeable. The Whisper of the Heart also contains scenes that obviously do not seem like the one Miyazaki will make. Scenes that seem kind of odd, like this one, I think. The very last final scene. In this scene, the boy hugs the girl saying, She's a good, I love you. You see the angle of his leg? He stretches his leg straight as a ramrod right here. Okay, it does not have to be like a ramrod. I know it. It doesn't. The audiences are all glued to his surprising line, Shizuku, I love you. But what makes this scene seem kind of odd is, I blame this ramrod leg. <laughs> These a little odd scenes, that's another reason why. I just don't get Whisper of the Heart. So from now on, I'll talk about what in the Whisper of the Heart is repelling Toshi Okada. There will be some criticism, so I think I'll do this in the second half. That's it for the free part, another prolonged lecture. Please fill in the questionnaire. In the second half, I'll be talking about scenes in Whisper of the Heart that seem questionable to me, like this ramrod leg scene. And Naushka, I did the opening sequence, so I'll talk about the closing sequence. You will learn that there is an amazing storyline going on. Hideaki Yano asked Miyazaki for permission to make a sequel of Naushka so many times. Why won't Miyazaki give him permission? Why did he make the change in the tapestry as I told you in the early part of the lecture? Miyazaki found out that Naushka was actually not a story of Naushka, but Naushka and Kushana. He found that out after he finished the production work for Naushka. The theme being about two princesses. How will this story be if you see it from Ohm's side? We can find another amazing sci-fi setting hidden in the story of Naushka. Those are what I'll be talking about in the second half. Please give me the result. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so sorry I couldn't speak so much about Whisper of the Heart. I'll talk about it more in the second half, so please wait a moment. The next lecture, I think, the topic will be Frozen, but I'm not really sure about it yet. I'm a little burned out with today's topic, Naushka. Okay, please switch to the second half.